Thank you. Um, as mentioned, this is truly an introduction. If you're curious about more about parking functions, um, you can check out my website in the bottom left corner of the slides and you can find some more information there. Okay, so the overview for today, we will start with defining parking functions. I'll share some examples with you. Then we'll count them in two ways, recursively and explicitly. And then I will address some generalizations. So things that people are currently working on and how you could come up with something if you wanted to work on them as well. If you've seen a car park before, then you have some intuition for parking functions. In the diagram on the slide, you can see on the right side, we have N parking spots. And this is a one-way street, so the cars can't back up and they can't you know, like leave the street and come back around. We also have N cars waiting to park. Like most drivers, each of these drivers has their spot that they would like to park in the most. And we call such a spot their preference. We keep track of each car's preference in a preference vector. So that is the ith car's preference goes in the ith spot of this vector. And we do allow cars to have the same preference so they don't have to be distinct. Then we have to define our parking rule. So this is how do the cars park? In the classical scenario, the parking rule states that each car drives to its preferred parking spot. If it's open, it parks there. And if it's occupied, it takes the next available spot. So you could imagine a car wants a spot, but that spot and all the spots after are filled, then the car cannot park. If our preference vector does allow all the cars to park, we call it a parking function of length n, where n denotes the number of spots on the street, as well as the number of cars waiting to park. So in quick notation, we will allow pf sub n to be the set of all parking functions of length n, and in absolute value bars, we're asking what's the size of that set, so how many parking functions do we have of length n? So for our examples, consider the preference vector 1111. What this says is the first car wants to park in the first spot, and it does. The second car wants to park in the first spot, sees it filled, so it parks in spot two. The third car wants the first spot, sees it filled, sees spot two filled, and takes spot three. And the fourth car wants the first spot, but sees it, spots two and three also filled, so it parks in spot four. Therefore, this is a parking function. If we consider the vector two, three, three, four, what this says is that car, two, car one wants the second spot and parks there. Car two wants the third spot and parks there. Car three wants the third spot, sees it filled and takes spot four and car four wants the fourth spot, sees it filled and can't park. Therefore, this is not a parking function. I claim that all permutations are parking functions, and we can see that this is because in a permutation, each car wants a distinct parking spot. So when we allow them to park, each car parks in exactly its, parking, its preference, and we have a parking function. So we know that for n greater than one, the number of parking functions of length n is greater than n factorial, and this is because we can have parking functions that are not permutations, such as 1111. How many more can we have? That's a great question. Um, so we have this recursive formula here. And to get this formula, we'll consider the street that's pictured here. What we have is n minus one cars that have already parked, and we have the nth car waiting to park. When we take a look at the cars that have already parked, we'll cut the street at spot i. Spot I could be any of the, the spots on the street. We're just gonna cut the street there. If we look at the cars that parked before spot I, we can see that there's I minus one of them. And we also have, the, we have those I minus one cars parked in I minus one spots. How many ways can that happen? Precisely the number of parking functions of length I minus one. So that gives us this term here. If we look at the cars that parked after spot I, we have N minus I of them. How many ways can we have n minus i cars park in n minus i spots? Precisely the number of parking functions of length n minus one, n minus i, and that gives us this term. Note that we have two groups. So if we pick all the elements of one, we have by default picked the elements of the other. So we need, we just choose to pick the cars that park before spot i, and that would be n minus one, choose i minus one ways to pick those cars, and that gives us this term here. And lastly, we have to consider the preference of car n. It could want spot one, spot two, all the way up to spot i. 
because if it wants any of those spots, it would get bumped and park in spot i, which would give us a parking function. And that's why we have this i here. Then we multiply everything together because they're all independent. And we have to sum from i equals one to n to account for the fact that i could be any of the spots on the tree. And that is how we get this recursive formula. But like most recursions, this one requires we know something about the previous cases to actually use it, which is not always very practical. Thankfully, some great minds um, discovered that as an explicit way to count them is to look at n plus one raised to the n minus one, where n is the number of cars and the parking spots. So to show this, we'll follow a proof outlined by Pollock in 1974. It's very succinct. It's six sentences, and a lot happens in those six sentences. So we'll walk through it together now. First, we the first four sentences say the following. Consider the straight street with n spots and n cars. Add an n plus first spot, put the parking spots in a circle, and then allow the cars to park in all of those spots. So the cars can declare, I would like the n plus first spot. That gives us a model that looks like this one. Then we say that alpha, our preference, alpha, our parking function, is a parking function if and only if the empty spot is the n plus first spot. We can see this because if we take alpha on the linear street, what that says is the cars park in the first n spots. Since then when we look at the circular street, the cars still park in the first n spots, which means the n plus first spot is open. To go backwards, assume the n plus first spot is open. That means the cars parked on the first n spots. When we go to the straight street, they park in the first n spots. Therefore, alpha is a parking function. For the fifth sentence of the proof, it is basically a lemma in and of itself. And I have the lemma here expressed with plus one. So what it says is if we have alpha, a parking function on our circular street, we and we park the cars, they park in some order P. Note that the PI are distinct because we can't have multiple cars park in the same spot. Then we define a new vector alpha plus one. And this is just our old vector alpha with one added to each entry mod n plus one. We claim that this new vector alpha plus one has the cars park in order p plus one, which is the original parking order shifted forward one mod n plus one. To show this, we set up a contradiction. So say that there's one car that doesn't park where we say that it must park. There are going to be two cases. One is that the car doesn't park there because the spot is empty. And the other is that the car doesn't park there because the spot is full. Following the logic for both of those, we contradict that alpha itself is a parking function. And therefore, we know that the lemma holds. This lemma is important because by iterating the process, we can say that we can say the same, se the same sentences, but with plus j mod n plus 1 rather than plus 1. That's important because it allows us to group all of the possible parking functions. So for sentence six, I think this one makes the most sense with an example. So we'll consider the example where n equals three. If you look at this table, the first column, that's just the number of the car. And then we're also considering the special case of the vector one, two, two. We say that two um, preference vectors are in the same group, so to speak, if one is a shift of the other. So looking at the AI, we can add one to each entry and we get two, three, three. Add one to each entry, we get three, zero, zero. Add one to each entry, we get zero, one, one. We claimed earlier that alpha is a parking function if and only if the n plus first spot is empty. Since we're working mod n plus one, the n plus first spot is also the zeroth spot. So looking at this group of vectors, we are looking for a vector that has the cars park such that no car is in the zeroth spot. If we look at PI plus three, we can see that the first car is in the zeroth spot, not great. If we look at PI plus two, we can see that the second car is in the zeroth spot, also not great. If we look at PI plus one, the third spot is in the zero, the third car is in the zeroth spot, not ideal. But when we look at PI, we can see that no car is in the zeroth spot. So looking at this group of vectors, the one good one, the one that is a parking function is one, two, two. Turns out we can do this for every single group. For We can do this for all of the possible parking functions. And there will only be one parking function in every group. 
So we take the total number of preference vectors we could have, which is n plus 1 raised to the n. And to get the one that works, we divide by n plus 1. And that tells us that the total number of parking functions of length n is n plus 1 raised to the n minus 1. Some generalizations of this. Um, these are things that people are currently working on. You could consider parking completions. This is an example where instead of the cars parking on a street that's empty, the cars are instead parking on a street that has some of the parking, parking spots obstructed. So this is kind of like when you're driving at the grocery store and you're like, there's a spot, only there's not a spot because the shopping carts are parked right there. You could consider K Naples parking functions. This is an example where the cars are allowed to back up to find a parking spot because you can imagine it's very likely that you pass an available spot to get the one you want and then you can't get it. So you'd like to go back for the one that you saw before. And you could also consider interval parking functions. This is a scenario where the cars not only have a preference, like they're a preferred spot, they also have a preference interval. So if all of the cars can park, but one of them is not inside its interval, then you wouldn't have a parking function in this scenario. If you are interested in coming up with your own parking function question, you need to consider two things. One, what do we know about the cars? So that could be like, um, what do they prefer? Do we have motorcycles and two of them can park in the same spot? Um, what do the parking spots look like on the street? And the next is what is the parking rule? So how do the cars go about parking? And you could also consider taking um, an existing parking world and asking a different question. And when we collect information about those, um, other information about those scenarios, we call that information a statistic. So you could count the number of cars that park in their preferred spot for example, and that would be a statistic. To wrap up, I would like to thank Math for All for allowing me to share with you this very brief introduction into parking functions. I would like to thank Professor Harris for introducing me to parking functions, as well as the Williams College Department of Math and Stats for um, providing an opportunity for me to conduct this research. <laughs>